Hi, everybody. Um, hope you are continuing to uh, keep safe and well, and you're enjoying uh, your creative uh, projects from Insight School of Art. We thought it would be a nice idea to, um, to ask you to do a little tonal drawing, um, tonal exercise. And the inspiration for the exercise is um, a Bulgarian artist called Christo. You may or may not have heard about him. He died actually only in the last two or three days. His death was announced on the news recently. And he was famous for wrapping up um, large buildings, huge chunks of landscape and industrial objects. So we're asking you to take an object from around the home and wrap it in a piece of neutral fabric. Okay. So I'm going to make um, a tonal drawing of this wrapped object to you. But this is really about um, a basic approach to making a tonal study of a neutral object by your object. So I'm going to start on the top left hand side of my object. I'm not actually going to draw the object itself. What I'm doing is I'm looking at the white paper on the outside of the object. This is the bit where the object doesn't physically exist. And what this is doing is it's separating the object from the space around it. Now the white paper isn't going to be particularly dark. There's no strong blacks anywhere in my composition today because I've got white fabric on white paper. So we're kind of in this lower to mid section of the tonal scale. So this is the outside of my object. Now at this point, the fabric, as it moves down, begins to be darker in tone than the white paper behind. So you can see that this hatched technique that I've chosen lends itself to sudden shifts of plane and direction. Okay, now where light and dark meet, just at this point here, where the fabric changes direction, this is the point at which the fabric receives the least amount of light. So this is the darkest part of the fabric, just there where it turns. Okay, now I'm going back inside my object here, and I'm starting to pick out where the fabric begins to pull in more tightly, and therefore the folds in the fabric are slightly more terse, more tensile, sharper if you like. Okay, now here there's a general sense of this being a really quite expansive area. So I, I, I'm just, you know, pushing the mark really more broadly, and more, in a more gestural kind of way, right across this large surface. So again, that hatched mark gives you that plain old uh, sense as you're putting it down. Okay, and then we come to an area where we're beginning to see sharper folds where the fabric begins to crease just in here. Now, don't be tempted to go too dark. So when we see folds and we see crevices and we see little cavernous spaces, we tend to almost subconsciously dig in with our pencil, almost like we're excavating into the spaces, the creases and the crevices. Don't do that. So vehemently because the line will become too heavy and it will start to jump out of the drawing, it will be too obtrusive. You've got to orchestrate the darks as well as orchestrating the lights. And feeling the weight of your mark, feeling the density and the pressure, that's experiential. The more you do it, the more you'll get a sense of that. Knowing instinctively how much weight to put on the mark. Okay, so here, we get into quite a complex little junction here. Now, I wouldn't expect you to be able to record every little subtle nuance of your folded fabric. That would be a big ask, wouldn't it? But if we can just get a general sense of where you think the fabric is twisting and moving, and as I say, chop and change the directional flow of your hatched line. This is the most effective technique to draw twists and folds in fabric because you can really push it in multi-directional ways quite easily, quite freely. Here's a really interesting junction because this is a moment where we've got real definition between the object and the background. The background is particularly darker at this junction, just in here. 
So again, this idea of the hatch line gives you control over the tone, obviously, but it also gives you the ability to change direction instantaneously, just push your mark around, depending upon, you know, how the fabric pulls and twists and wraps its way around um, your object. So just gradually, just, you know, when you darken something, do it incrementally, very, very slowly, very, very gradually. So now we've got a little bit of space between the object and what's happening behind. So the object begins to come forward and the background, even though it's just white paper, totally reacts against the lighter part of my object and brings it out of space. Um, that white paper is darker than the white fabric out here. I've got this bizarre indeterminate shape because the fabric doesn't hug it perfectly. It just kind of gives little, as I said to you before, little tantalizing clues um, as to what's underneath. We don't really know, the viewer doesn't know. The viewer's wondering, the viewer's guessing, the viewer's anticipating, but the viewer doesn't know. So that shadows are basically where the light isn't falling. Now in order, obviously, to suggest the light, we have to draw the darks because the light creates the dark. So I'm going to really, half close my eyes and squint, the tone of the shadow of the object is not dissimilar to the tone of the right-hand side of the object itself. So I'm using my elbow at this juncture. Notice that the mark's a little bit more energized, slightly more loose and expressive. That's because I'm physically opening up my arm a little bit and I'm using my shoulder. Okay. Now at this point, if you wanted to, you could try the other technique that I talked about, which is the cross hatching. Cross hatching is good for expressing flatter, larger areas in tone. So this is a flat area, the shadow. So I'm using the cross hatch technique here by taking my lines in the opposite direction to the lines beneath, and then just building up a mesh. Change the, the direction again so it goes diagonally across. So again, I'm using my elbow a little bit, so I'm covering quite a large area. As soon as that shadow goes in, it tells us about the directional light source coming across our subject. And we can see it's coming from um, the left hand side. So I'm not going to draw every little nuanced, you know twist of the surface of the fabric, that would take too long for a demonstration. But all I'm doing really is trying to give the general sense of how this fabric is being pulled, how it's twisting, and how it's wrapping itself around my chosen um, object. And here, it begins to crease up a little bit. Not too, not too much, just a little sense. And then right in this little section here, this is where our dark really begins to um, kick in. Again, it's that hatched mark that allows me to cover large planal shifts quite freely. I'm not going to use cross hatching on this object, but I'll save that for the shadow, but that's flatter and more expansive. Whereas this is planal and it changes direction. Okay, now, again, thinking about our paper at the top, Okay, now, finally, just have a look at some of the very, very darkest areas of the folds. You might be just tune them in the last couple of minutes, just tune some of the strongest darks without pressing too firmly. And that should, that hatched mark should give you a plain directional feel to your tonal study.